in the bowl. <laughs> kind of a funny way of doing this. You know, it's interesting. Like, I don't know that I expected as a chef, like in the restaurant industry for years, for my career to take such a crazy turn. But Sabretooth has been really a very organic evolution of cooking for a living, you know? Every chef is looking for inspiration. They're always searching for it somewhere. And somehow I ended up landing in this world where the ingredients that I was inspired to cook with, I wasn't able to cook with in my restaurants. It was literally illegal. And so for this evolution to take place, I had to create a new project. And so for me, Sabretooth is all about having an opportunity as a chef to continue to grow and evolve and work with really exciting ingredients like an Oryx, for example, preparing a dish that maybe the last time it was prepared was 2000 years ago. So Sabretooth began as a dinner party and then it kind of grew into a series of dinner parties. And now it's evolved into this mission to travel around this country and frankly, hopefully travel around the world and meet a lot of like-minded chefs, a lot of like-minded cooks who want to explore just how far wild game can be taken. You know, the same kind of thought process that I have, which is that the culinary potential of game is limitless. The only thing that's limiting it so far is people's ideas. In a perfect world, every saber-tooth meal is telling the story of a local terroir. So that means the animals and the plants from a very specific region combined together in a meal. That doesn't mean just one animal, it could mean a bounty of animals, or it could be hyper-focused like this meal is gonna be. I kind of have a weird love affair with Oryx. I don't really know even myself why that's the case. Um, I tasted an Oryx burger maybe five years ago, thought it was the best burger I've ever had in my life, and then just went down the rabbit hole of understanding this animal. And I've harvested a number of Oryx and I've brought them back home to Georgia, but I've never actually harvested one in Texas and then served it to people in Texas. And that's why I spent all this time to do this because I feel like there's this animal roaming the hillside here that so many native Texans have never even heard of, much less tasted. Look, there's a lot of misconceptions around exotic hunting in Texas. And honestly, misconception may be a strong word. I imagine that a lot of what people know about it is probably some of the bad stuff that has happened in the past. But for me, exotic hunting is a way to supplement with some really high quality meat in what is normally the off season. I know that by spending a little bit of money and contributing to a management hunt by taking off an older animal, that I'm helping a ranch like this to be able to foster these populations for many, many years to come. A lot of these animals, unfortunately, have gone extinct in their natural habitat, but through conservation and stewardship here in the hill country, they've outlasted them in their natural state, and here they're thriving in Texas. Yeah, I mean, Scimitar Oryx is one in particular that, you Absolutely. know, when you talk to people about it and they go, there are no Scimitar Oryx, and you go, well, there might not be back there, but the yeah, latest not, figures not I saw is that there's somewhere close to 15,000 Scimitar Oryx in Texas. Yes, sir, and probably continue to grow from that. a lot of folks have a hard time wrapping their heads around is that um, nobody can afford to just take care of them out of goodwill and a desire to do right by the earth. Like um, very few people can at least. Most people, there needs to be some sort of economy to it. These animals having a monetary value, even if that value is in harvesting a big trophy, allows you and your brothers and your family to, to then take that money and pour it back into growing the herd yes. to improving their habitat right. whether it be through right. feed or through medicine to help them when they're sick right so one of my meat eater colleagues um she just built a new house i kind of like volunteered myself to semi cater her like housewarming party and i landed on wanting to do this oryx like that's how this whole thing came about is that I love it. I just think it's the most delicious, surprisingly delicious thing. And so I was thinking about the history of the Oryx and 
you know, North Africa and ancient Rome, and it's, I, I got really nerdy about it, basically. But nevertheless, I've promised to show up with this Oryx and help and help prepare it for her for her housewarming party. So I'm putting a lot of a lot of uh, pressure on you here. Like we gotta we gotta do the best that we can. Um, not only is this thing gonna taste delicious, but I mean, I could bring a number of things and make them taste delicious, but I really want this Oryx because I think it's gonna be something special, and they've never had it. If you want an oryx, you got to come to Texas. And if you're going to come to Texas to harvest an oryx, I would say then let Texas inform some of the way that you choose to cook it. These ingredients, the locality of them, the seasoning, all of these things, even though we're talking about a dish from ancient Rome when we're talking about preparing this oryx, we're still talking about oregano and coriander and cilantro and flavors that make sense to your average Texan. And so, Cooking this dinner here, it's almost like it's gonna taste better somehow because the story is just so much stronger. It has such a strong sense of place, despite the fact that it's a foreigner, I'm a foreigner, but at the same time, I think that once we all sit down together at this table and share a meal, we're all gonna feel like we're at home. Hey. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I appreciate you taking the time to come help us out. Yeah, man. Cut this animal up. Yeah. So, got the whole family here. Hi. How are you? Hi. How Hi. are y'all? Thanks for letting us come uh, mess up your house. Well, come on in. All right. Let's do it. Come on, pups. Good dog. You get the big work. I see this. <laughs> pretty dry though, man. It's kind of no, it looks there. great. It looks great. I mean, if you got to store it in a cooler, you can't ask for anything better than that. It's just a little bit of exterior moisture on it. As far as like what we're going to do here, I would love to serve this heart because it's so big. Like I'd love to serve yeah. this as just like a grilled heart with like a, like a shermoula or like an herb sauce, just like as a little, okay. little app type thing. So, so if you, you want, want me to break it down 
like and I normally break it open so it lays right. flat and then we can cut it. Do you want exactly. it in cubes or like thin strips? I think thin strips so we can okay. kind of weave them and then get a quick okay. grill on it. With this, honestly, we just got a lot of work to do here. So if you want to split this and start breaking it down, that'd be helpful. I'm going to take, I'm going to debone this because I have an idea for wanting to roast this shoulder whole over the fire. But as I'm working on it, we'll kind of make that, that decision. So as Sabretooth continues to evolve, the goal will always be to look just on the other side of the mountain that's in front of us, figuratively speaking. You know, it's trying to look just a little bit deeper. It's trying to look at a place that maybe I don't know very much about, but it allows me to learn about that place. It allows me to learn about their culture through way of cooking some sort of animal, by harvesting a species of game, by fishing for something. You know, as we continue to choose these animals that we work with, they're chosen because A, they have high culinary potential, but also because they tell a unique sense of place story for the people that are surrounding them. It's a fine line with this world of exotics. I mean, Jesse, you serve these in your restaurant. Well, you don't serve Rorix, but you serve exotics. You serve Nilgai, right? Yeah, we'll serve uh, any exotic and get our hands on, really, because it's a it's a, just a great option to serve like a truly wild animal without you know serving a game animal. Right. I think that if you can stop long enough to recognize their culinary virtue and how delicious they are, maybe people would be a little bit more willing to embrace um, you know stewarding these animals and taking care of them. Plus, when you add in the fact that the conservation story is really important, I think that's, I think it makes it worthwhile, to me mm -hmm. at least. Every pound of this meat that you eat has one less pound that has to come out of a pretty broken system as far as, yeah. you know, like a food, feedlot beef or something like that. So if you are able to access this, whether you're hunting it or whether you're just consuming it as a gift, you're still participating in, you know, getting something off the land that is a very low impact animal. And so each one of these has like a very varied story, you know, the Axis, the Nilgai, the Audad, the, the Oryx, they all come from all these different places and have different impacts on their environments. But at the end of the day, if you're able to eat them, right. uh, then I think they do serve a great purpose. I think there's probably a big popular conception that like, oh, well, these are just African animals that we brought here just because we want to shoot them. Yeah, right. You know, and I, don't, I think there's more to it than that. that <laughs> there definitely to is. Told. Yeah, and you're right. There is a lot more story than that. Like, I mean, the reality is that these things are effectively extinct in their native range. And were it not for animals transplanted from Texas back there, they really wouldn't have any chance um, for a successful reintroduction. Actually, for your party, Daniel, I kind of have some maybe kooky ideas, but I think it would be fun to take some of the ideas, some of the methods that were used, some of the flavorings that were used in places like ancient Rome and ancient Egypt and blend that into this because um, I think that could be an interesting spin on how to showcase this animal to people who have never had it for the first time. My belief is that wild game and game meats in general really are the pinnacle of culinary sort of greatness. I mean, we have really become obsessed with this notion that the stuff we can buy is somehow better than the stuff we can go harvest. But from what I've seen as a professional chef, that's just not true. something for y'all for your dinner. Sorry I can't make it, but Lovely. look at that. A little bit of Sotol. Nice. Oh, Texas goodness. wine. I love it. And some beer. Oh, That's killer. Beer? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Cool. You're going right. to love it. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, Thank man. you so much. It's going to be you. awesome. Thank you. It's good seeing y'all. Oh, Good to see you. Thanks for uh, helping right. us break that down. You bet. Yeah, you're a lot faster than we are.
Yeah. Appreciate the expertise. Yeah, and that was fun. <laughs> I'm gonna enjoy it. Thanks for right. kicking me some. See you later, man. We'll get together soon. All right. All right. Thanks, y'all. So, if you've harvested an oryx and you Google how to prepare an oryx, you're probably gonna come back with nothing. And that's what I quickly learned, is that there's not really recipes out there for it. And so after some deep digging, and honestly that digging ended up being in history books, I landed on this cookbook, Epiceus. And it was one of the only places where I could find any reference to an oryx being prepared. And when I saw the recipes, they both seemed completely foreign to me, and they also seemed like they made perfect sense. And so I've chosen this recipe because I believe that it represents something that's really cool, which is the history, the origin point of an ingredient brought forward into the new world. Like this transitions perfectly. I think when people taste this, they're gonna go, wow, I've never had anything quite like that. And that's always the goal of Sabretooth, for people to go, wow, I've never quite had anything like that. Simultaneously, this is a growing like evolution for me. This is, I'm doing this not just for the diners, I'm doing it for myself to continue to grow as a culinarian. And that means experimenting with, you know, sometimes it's new dishes, sometimes it's things that have existed long before we are, were around and remembering that the only way to evolve a cuisine is by understanding its genesis. What are you making here? Okay, so this is... You mentioned this is for the shoulder? Yeah, so this is, let me be clear, this is a modern interpretation of a recipe that is about 3,000 years old. So from what I could read in this book, like, and so I know it's weird that I'm like going so like ancient history, I just, I think it's cool that this animal, this oryx that has been around for so long, sort of disappeared and is now coming back like, I just think that's interesting. And so when you go in online, let's, let's say you just Google an Oryx recipe, you're not gonna find a modern Oryx recipe. You're gonna uh -huh. find, if you find anything, you're gonna see this reference to like this stuff that happened thousands of years ago. And in my mind, like there's no reason why we can't take that as inspiration and modernize it and it make perfect sense in this scenario. Like I it's, think it's also just yeah. a wonderful way to pay homage to something that has been done far longer way before us that right. we've simply forgotten. Right, exactly, and I just think it's cool. And so appreciate. we're gonna try something weird here. So here we go, um, milk. They liked their food sweet. Like, now this is going to get basted. The reason we're leaving that little bit of wine behind is that we're gonna mix that wine with honey and olive oil to baste mm. it as it cooks. Pretty cool to be here at Danielle's house. I've never been here before. I've never seen her gardens in real life. I've learned a lot about gardening from Danielle. Uh, I am totally an amateur, and so it's really cool to see this. And it's pretty awesome as well to have the dinner here. I mean, obviously we're gonna get some produce from here, but because we're kind of in the country, like we have opportunity to get stuff from really close by. Like she's got a neighbor that has a ton of different vegetables that we're gonna be able to pick and use. And I just think this is gonna be the perfect setting. You know, Sabretooth isn't always about doing these really elaborate restaurant level meals. A lot of time it's just about the idea of sitting down and preparing a meal and sharing it with friends. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing here. All right, I guess we need to actually write this book. We're just kind of like making I know. stuff up. <laughs> I know, like I, I love that we have so many great ideas, but I really want to narrow down things. And the way that I approach cooking is always first and foremost, what's in season. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense too, because the idea for, of even like doing this works was to try to show people something that um, had some interesting culinary history and obviously like 
prior to not that many years ago, everybody ate seasonally. So, yeah. um, all right, well, so we know, first of all, let's, let's talk about what we know we have. So we have that Oryx shoulder that is already in marinade. So okay. we have that, that's, that's definitely happening. Yeah, I would say that's the main protein. That's okay. the largest of them. Okay. But I also have the back strap from that Oryx that I thought I would just season oh, right. like um, with Raza Hanout, you know, like a, a, a mm -hmm. spice blend just so that we have a little bit more of a simple preparation on it that just shows it's just traditional flavor. Like this is what the meat tastes like with very little adornment, you know? Okay. I have one thing that I want to make as an appetizer with the tartare. Okay. That's going to be served cold because tomorrow is going to be a much hotter in the 90s. But I think also, since we're already going to be on the grill, it'll just be great to have something to pull right off the grill and eat immediately. Yeah. Let's do like just like a very simple like skewered heart and then like an herb sauce, you know? Like a, a salsa verde or a shermoula or something, okay. some sort of like very fresh, l cold, you know, yeah. like something that's really light. Very there. zesty. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, and another thing that I want to do, um, my favorite time of this year, it's early summer, which means uh, the zucchini and the squash are all blooming. And I really, really love squash blossoms. This is the only time of the year where you really get to indulge in them. Yeah. And it's, it is just like the highlight. I think maybe we probably need starch of some sort. So there's this, it's a street food dish in Egypt called hawashi. But basically you take ground meat and you put it inside pita bread mm -hmm. and you kind of make these flat hamburgers and then you grill them. With the meat already in the bread. Yeah, raw. Raw, yes, that, exactly. I've never <laughs> even heard of, or even like, why haven't I even thought of that? Then what are we gonna do for dessert? I think we should do something with pecans and Agreed. honey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of local honey producers in this area. I think this is going to be a big meal, so I think just like a, something that's like we can do in little light bites. Like we could totally make, I mean, I've never made pecan baklava, but I don't know why we couldn't make pecan baklava. Uh, I've never made it, but I think, why not? Yeah, I mean, right, something. it should work, right? I mean, we have <laughs> yeah. honey, we have pecans. Yeah. I've been driven as Sabretooth has evolved to choose locations further out, further out, further out, and dig a little bit deeper to find that species of game or fish or a plant that's somewhere that I believe tells a really unique story of that place, but unfortunately a story that has oftentimes just been lost to time, that a lot of folks in the modern world simply don't understand it. Mm. It's actually cooking pretty fast, uh, which is not bad. I just don't want to overcook this. You know, you definitely want to serve something like, well, most game meats you want to serve pretty rare. I'm shooting for like a true medium rare medium kind of to the interior of this because I've taken all of that silver skin out. It should be actually pretty tender. Plus we're going to slice it really thin. Um, anytime I do like a rotisserie preparation, like something like this, as simple as just a steak over a fire. I mean, this is a technique that I don't know how many thousands of years old. This is probably our first cooking technique. And it's just really cool. It's also really cool to be doing a basting liquid with like wine and honey and stuff like that. There's just, it just exudes that history. And for me, I've always found that the best way for me at least to be able to think of new ideas is to think of old ideas. Like understand where, where the thought process began and then you can evolve it. And that's what this is. This is kind of the modern Texas American iteration of a concept that's two, 3,000 years old, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Hey, I think that's good. Oh, Daniel always plates things so beautifully. I aspire to plate things like Daniel's. Oh my god, it's a story. Pepper. 
I tried. I was talking to Daniel about like, going up there. Yeah. 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 Pigs that have made their way down there now for the last like, five years. Well, guys, I really appreciate you letting me be here. I mean, this is it's a big deal for me to have people allow me and Danielle, my friends, whoever I'm cooking with, to be able to prepare wild game in this elevated way. You know, as a chef, it's really important to me to spread this gospel as a chef, as a hunter. And so the fact that y'all sat down, had this meal, all of us, and hopefully enjoyed it, it means a lot to me personally. So thank you very much. I hope I can come back soon. Next time I'll whip up something else for you. So thank I appreciate you. it. Thank, thank you, you guys. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.